Hi, this is Grandma and I'm reading Call of the Wild by Jack London. And we're going to be uh, beginning with chapter four. In chapter three, which was called The Dominant Primordial Beast, um, Buck and Spitz um, had finally had a fight. Till death, Spitz was, was uh, killed, not by Buck, but by the, um, the 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 rest of the huskies um the way the dog fights go is the two of them fight and when one of them um lands on his back and can't get up in uh spitz's case he had broken legs um then the other huskies come and finish them off this is called who has won to mastership buck is expecting to become the lead dog now Hey, what I say, I speak true when I say that buck two devils. This was Francois's speech next morning when he discovered Spitz missing and Buck covered with wounds. He drew him to the fire and by its light pointed them out. That Spitz fight like hell, said Perrault as he surveyed the gaping rips and, and cuts. And that buck fight like two hells, was Francois's answer. And now we make good time. No more spits, no more trouble, sure. When Perrault packed the camp outfit and loaded the sled, the dog driver proceeded to harness the dogs. Buck trotted up to the place Spitz would have occupied as leader, but Francois, not noticing him, brought Solix to the coveted position. In his judgment, Solix was the best lead dog left. Buck sprang upon Solix in a fury, driving him back and standing in his place. Eh, eh, Francois cried, slapping his thighs gleefully. Look at that buck. Him kill that spitz. Him tink to take the job. Go away, chunk, he cried, but Buck refused to budge. He took Buck by the scruff of his neck and, though the dog growled threateningly, dragged him to one side and replaced Solix. The old dog did not like it and showed plainly that he was afraid of Buck. Francois was obdurate, but when he turned his back, Buck again displaced Solix, who was not at all unwilling to go. Francois was angry. Now, by gar, I fix you, here it coming back with a heavy club in his hand. <coughs> Excuse me, I didn't read that right. Francois was angry. Now, by gar, I fix you, he cried, coming back with a heavy club in his hand. Buck remembered the man in the red sweater and retreated slowly, nor did he attempt to charge in when Solix was once more brought forward. But he circled just beyond the range of the club snarling with bitterness and rage, and while he circled, he watched the club so as to dodge it if it thrown by Francois, for he was become wise in the way of clubs. The driver went about his work, and he called to Buck when he was ready to put him in his old place in front of Dave. Buck retreated two or three steps. Francois followed him up, whereupon he again retreated. After some time of this, Francois threw down the club, thinking that Buck feared a thrashing, but Buck was in open revolt. He wanted not to escape a clubbing, but to have the leadership. It was his by right. He had earned it, and he would not be content with less. Perrault took a hand. Between them, they ran about him about for the better part of an hour. They threw clubs at him. He dodged. They cursed him, his father's and his mother's before him, and all his seed to come after him, down to the remotest generation and every hair on his body and drop of blood in his veins, and he answered curse with snarl and kept out of their reach. He did not try to run away, but retreated around and around the camp, advertising plainly that when his desire was met, he would come in and be good. Francois sat down and scratched his head. Perrault looked at his watch and swore. Time was flying, and they should have been on the trail an hour gone. Francois scratched his head again. He shook it and grinned sheepishly at the courier, who shrugged his shoulders in sign that they were beaten. Then Francois went up to where Solix stood and called to Buck. Buck laughed as dogs laugh, yet kept his distance. 
Francois unfastened Sullick's traces and put him back in his old place. The team stood harnessed to the sled in an unbroken line, ready for the trail. There was no place for Buck save at the front. Once more, Francois called, and once more, Buck laughed and kept away. Throw down the club, Perrault commanded. Francois complied, whereupon Buck trotted in, laughing triumphantly, and swung around into his position at the head of the team. His traces were fastened, the sled broken out, and with both men running, they dashed out on the river trail. Highly as the dog driver had forevalued Buck with his two devils, he found while the day was yet young that he had undervalued. At a bound, Buck took up the duties of leadership and where judgment was required and quick thinking and quick acting, he showed himself the superior even of Spitz, of whom Francois had never seen an equal. But it was in giving the law and making his mates live up to it that Buck excelled. Dave and Solix did not mind the change in leadership. It was none of their business. Their business was to toil and toil mightily in the traces. So long as they were that were not interfered with, they did not care what happened. Billy, the good-natured, could lead for all they cared, as long as he kept order. The rest of the team, however, had grown unruly during the last days of Spitz, and their surprise was great now that Buck proceeded to lick them into shape. Pike, who pulled at Buck's heels and who never put an ounce more of his weight against the breastband than he was compelled to, was swiftly and repeatedly shaken for loafing. And ere the first day was done, he was pulling more than ever before in his life. The first night in camp, Joe, the sour one, was punished roundly, a thing that Spitz had never success, succeeded in doing. Buck simply smothered him by virtue of superior weight and cutting up till he ceased snapping and began to whine for mercy. The general tone of the team picked up immediately. It recovered its old time solidarity and once more the dogs leaped as one dog in the traces. At the Rink Rapids, two native huskies, Tink and Kona, were added, and the celerity with which Buck broke them in took away Francois' breath. Never such a dog as that Buck, he cried. No, never. Him worth one thousand dollar, by gar, eh? What you say, Perrault? And Perrault nodded. He was ahead of the record then and gaining day by day. The trail was in excellent condition, well packed and hard, and there was no new fallen snow with which to contend. It was not too cold. The temperature dropped to 50 below zero and remained there the whole trip. The men rode and ran by turn, and the dogs were kept on the jump with but infrequent stoppages. The 30-mile river was comparatively coated with ice, and they covered in one day going out what had taken them 10 days coming in. In one run, they made a 60-mile dash from the foot of Lake Labarge to the White Horse Rapids, across Marsh, Tagish, and Bennett, 70 miles of lakes. They flew so fast that the man whose turn it was to run towed behind the sled at the end of a rope. And on the last night of the second week, they topped White Pass and dropped, dropped down the sea slope with the lights of Skagway and the shipping at their feet. It was a record run. Each day for 14 days, they had averaged 40 miles. For three days, Perrault and Francois threw chests up and down the main street of Skagway and were deluged with invitations to drink while the team was constant center of a worshipful crowd of dog busters and mushers. Then three or four Western bad men aspired to clean out the town, were riddled like pepper boxes for their pains and public interest turned to other idols. Next came official orders. Francois called Buck to him, threw his arms around him and wept over him. And that was the last of Francois and Perrault. Like other men, they passed out of Buck's life for good. So the orders were that the dog team had to, to do something new. 
A Scotch half-breed took charge of him and his mates, and in company with a dozen other dog teams, he started back over the weary trail to Dawson. It was no light running now, nor record time, but heavy toil each day with a heavy load behind, for this was the mail train, carrying word from the world to the men who sought gold under the shadow of the pole. Buck did not like it, but he bore up well to the work, taking pride in it after the manner of Dave and Solix, and seeing that his mates, whether they prided in it or not, did their fair share, it was a monotonous life, operating with machine-like regularity. One day was very like another. At a certain time each morning, the cooks turned out, fires were built, and breakfast was eaten. Then, while some broke camp, others harnessed the dogs, and they were underway an hour or so before the darkness fell, which gave warning of dawn. At night, camp was made. Some pitched the flies, others cut firewood, and pine boughs for the beds, and still others carried water or ice for the cooks. Also, the dogs were fed. To them, this was the one feature of the day, though. It was good to loaf around. After the fish was eaten, for an hour or so with the other dogs, of which there were five score and odd, there were fierce fighters among them, but three battles with the fiercest brought Buck to mastery so that when he bristled and showed his teeth, they got out of his way. Best of all, perhaps, he loved to lie near the fire. Hind legs crouched under him, four legs stretched out in front, head raised and eyes blinking dreamily at the flames. Sometimes he thought of Judge Miller's big house in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley and of the cement swimming tank and Isabel, the Mexican hairless, and Toots, the Japanese pug, but oftener he remembered the man in the red sweater, the death of Curly, the great fight with Spitz, and the good things he had eaten or would like to eat. He was not homesick. The sunland was very dim and distant, and such memories had no power over him. Far more potent were the memories of his heredity. They gave things he'd never seen before a seemingly familiarity. The instincts, which were but the memories of his ancestors becoming habits, which had lapsed in later days and still later in him, quickened and became alive again. Sometimes as he crouched there, blinking dreamily at the flames, it seemed that the flames were of another fire and that as he crouched by this other fire, he saw another and different man from the half-breed cook before him. This other man was shorter of leg and longer of arm, with muscles that were stringy and knotty, rather than rounded and swelling. The hair of this man was long and matted, and his head slanted back under, under it from the eyes. He uttered strange sounds and seemed very much afraid of the darkness, into which he peered continually, clutching in his hand, which hung midway between knee and foot. A stick with a heavy stone made fast to the end. He was all but naked, a ragged and fire-scorched skin hanging partway down his back, but on his body there was much hair. In some places across the chest and shoulders and down the outsides of the arm and thighs, it was matted into almost a thick fur. He did not stand erect, but with trunk inclined forward from the hips on legs that bent at the knees. About his body, there was a peculiar springiness or resiliency, almost cat-like, and a quick alertness as one who lived in a perpetual fear of things seen and unseen. Now, I want you to understand this is not someone who is actually standing before him. This is um, a prehistoric man that he is describing, a caveman. Um, he has dredged up the memories of his ancestors and perhaps the first master of his ancestor, who was a caveman. At other times, this hairy man squatted by the fire with head between his legs and slept. On such occasions, his elbows were on his knees, his hands clasped above his head as though to shed rain by the hairy arms. And beyond that fire in the circling darkness, 
but could see many gleaming coals, two by two, always two by two, which he knew to be the eyes of great beasts of prey. And he could hear the crushing of their bodies through the undergrowth and the noises they made in the night. And dreaming there by the Yukon bank with lazy eyes blinking at the fire, these sounds and sights of another world would make the hair to rise along his back and stand on end across his shoulders and up his neck till he whimpered low and suppressedly or growled softly and the half-breed crook shouted at him, Hey, you buck, wake up! Whereupon the other world would vanish and the real world would come into his eyes and he would get up and yawn and stretch as though he had been asleep. It was a hard trip with the mail behind them and the heavy work wore them down. They were short of weight and in poor condition when they made Dawson and should have had a 10 days or a week's rest at best. But in two days time, they dropped down the Yukon bank from the barracks loaded with letters for the outside. The dogs were tired, the drivers grumbling, and to make matters worse, it snowed every day. This meant a soft trail, greater friction on the runners, and heavier pulling for the dogs. Yet the drivers were fair through it all and did their best for the animals. Each night, the dogs were attended to first. They ate before the drivers ate, and no man sought his sleeping robe till he had seen to the feet of the dogs he drove. Still, their strength went down. Since the beginning of the winter, they had traveled 1,800 miles, dragging sleds the whole weary distance, and 1,800 miles will tell upon the life of the toughest. Buck stood it, keeping his mates up to their work and maintaining discipline, though he too was very tired. Billy cried and whimpered regularly in his sleep each night. Joe was sourer than ever, and Solix was unapproachable, blind side or other side. But it was Dave who suffered most of all. Something had gone wrong with him. He became more morose and irritable, and when camp was pitched at once, he made his nest where his driver fed him. Once out of the harness and down, he did not get on his feet again till harness up time in the morning. Sometimes in the traces, when jerked by a sudden stoppage of the sled or by straining to start it, he would cry out in pain. The driver examined him but could find nothing. All the drivers became interested in his case. They talked it over at mealtime and over their last pipes before going to bed. And one night they held a consultation he was brought from his nest to the fire and was pressed and prodded till he cried out many times. Something was wrong inside, but they could locate no broken bones and could not make it out. By the time Cassiar Bar was reached, he was so weak that he was falling repeatedly in the traces. The Scotch half-breed called a halt, took him out of the team, making the next dog Solix fast to the sled. His intention was to rest Dave, letting him run free behind the sled. Sick as he was, Dave resented being taken out, grunting and growling while the traces were unfastened, and a whimpering brokenheartedly when he saw Solix in the position he had held and served so long. For the pride of trace and trail was his, and sick unto death, he could not bear that another dog should do his work. <coughs> when the sled started, he floundered in the soft snow alongside the beaten trail, attacking Solix with his teeth, rushing against him and trying to thrust him off into the soft snow on the other side. Striving to leap inside his traces and get between him and the sled, all the while whining and yelping and crying with grief and pain. The half-breed tried to drive him away with the whip, but he paid no heed to the stinging lash, and the man had not the heart to strike harder. Dave refused to run quietly on the trail behind the sled, where the going was easy, but continued to flounder alongside in the soft snow where the going was most difficult till exhausted. Then he fell and lay where he fell, howling lugubriously 
as the long train of sleds churned by. With the last remnant of his strength, he managed to stagger along behind till the train made another stop. When he floundered past the sleds to his own where he stood alongside Solix, his driver lingered a moment to get a light for his pipe from the man behind. Then he returned and started his dogs. They swung out on the trail with remarkable lack of exertion, turned their heads uneasily and stopped in surprise. The driver was surprised too. The sled had not moved. He called his comrades to witness the sight. Dave had bitten through both of Solik's traces and was standing directly in front of the sled in his proper place. He pleaded with his eyes to remain there. The driver was perplexed. His comrades talked of how a dog could break its heart through being denied the work that killed it and recalled instances they had known where dogs too old for the toil or injured had died because they were cut out of the traces. Also, they held it a mercy since Dave was to die anyway that he should die in the traces, heart easy and content. So he was harnessed in again and proudly he pulled as of old, the more than once he cried out involuntarily from the bite of his inward hurt. Several times he fell down and was dragged in the traces, and once the sled ran upon him so that he limped thereafter in one of his line, hind legs, but he held out till camp was reached. When the driver made a place for him by the fire, morning found him too weak to travel. At harness-up time, he tried to crawl to his driver. By convulsive efforts, he got on his feet, staggered, and fell. Then he wormed his way forward, slowly toward where the harnesses were being put on his mates. He would advance his forelegs and drag up his body with a sort of hitching movement. When he would advance his forelegs and hitch ahead again for a few more inches, his strength left him. The last his mates saw of him, he lay gasping in the snow and yearning toward them, but they could hear him mournfully howling till they passed out of sight behind a belt of river timber. Here the train was halted. The Scotch half-breed slowly retraced his steps to the camp they had left. The men ceased talking. A revolver shot rang out. The man came back hurriedly, the whip snapped, the bells tinkled merrily, the sleds churned along the trail. The buck knew, and every dog knew, what had taken place behind the belt of river trees. Do you know what happened? Well, they had put Dave and let him run as much as he could until he was almost dead. And um, they led the dogs away from Dave and uh, one of the men went back and shot him. It was uh, a mercy. Uh, he could no longer run, but they didn't want to leave him to be torn apart by wolves. So um, he was shot. Well, that was interesting about how, how much the dogs love to be a part of the team and to be in the trace. Um, it's, it's just hard to believe that they would feel that way, but they did. Okay, that's all for now. Bye-bye.